Hello there friends, my name is Rachel GNS Middle, Gilbert and Sullivan is my middle name and my middle name is my last name and I am here on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them. As a point of interest, this is actually the first video I've made since I actually started publishing the videos. I made a lot of them in one big clump and then Christmas happened. Thank you very much everyone for all the support you've given me so far. It really means a lot to me. I've got quite a lot of new subscribers. Wouldn't mind some more. That would be nice. It costs nothing to subscribe. You just click that subscribe button. You can also click the bell if you want. That just means I guess you'll get an email when I release a new video. First of all, to address a horrible lie that I made in the last video, we're not going to be talking about baritone arias this week, as you can probably tell by the title of the video. But that is simply because that is going to be an epic video that I'm making with William Remmers, because he is a baritone and likes to sing arias, so I thought his input would be very valuable in that one. But because we are busy and diaries were clashing, we are only going to be filming that next week, so I needed to have one or two more videos before I put that one out. But today we are going to be discussing the openings of all of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas, which restricts me to 14 items, which is quite nice. So let's see if we can get this one under 45 minutes. <laughs> this time the parameters proved very tricky. I went through quite a few permutations of different scores before I got a table that even slightly resembled sanity. For a start, these openings get a mark out of 20 for music. They also get a mark out of 10 for lyrics, and this is specifically just the beauty slash poetry of the lyrics. I've also given them a mark out of 10 for dramatic impact, and that is purely just how much they have the potential just to wow the audience and really knock their socks off. I've given them a mark out of 10 for how successfully they set up the story. I've also given them a mark out of 10 for how successfully they set up the character of the chorus that are singing that opening number. All these choruses have a kind of essence and it's just how successfully that essence is created in this initial number. So with that in mind, let's get started. And number 14 we have and this didn't really surprise me, and I feel bad that this one always seems to come in last, but it is Thespis. Throughout the night, the constellations. I do think it deserves this place in last place. It got a mark of 34. The one above it got 40. There really wasn't a contest. There was nothing I could do to give it a boost. I've only watched two of these. The one I did with Savoy Net, and another one that was on GS Opera TV. And even though I think that both productions did a really good job with it, it's just quite underwhelming, this number. The music is lovely. I gave it a 14 for music, which I think is fair considering that we don't really know what it was, but I imagine it was beautiful and ethereal. I only gave it a 5 for lyrics. They're not particularly clever or funny and don't really show a lot of Gilbert's normal wit that we're used to. It makes such a pitiful dramatic impact in my opinion. I only gave it five for that as well. And what's so interesting is that it doesn't seem to fit at all with that injection of energy that comes after it from these really cool characters that you then meet. It just seems like a really wet opening and really nothing like any of the other openings in Gilbert and Sullivan. I also gave it fives for the other two categories as well, and I think I was being nice, if anything. I don't really see how it does set up the story, only that it says that the stars slash gods, because it is the gods chorus, but they're also stars, that they're tired and nobody's paying attention to them. There's no emotion, there's no stakes in these lyrics. It's just a very gentle introduction to what I think has the potential to be a very exciting and dynamic opera. So I do think that they slightly dropped the ball on this one. Number 13, I have given to, and please do not come at me for this one, Poor O' Paul, the Pirate Sherry from the Pirates of Penzance. I gave it a 13 out of 20 for music, which I think is absolutely fair. I listened to this several times thinking to myself, is this really slightly below Sullivan's average? And I think it is. If you consider that Sullivan's standard good stuff 
would score a 14. I think this is a 13. I gave it a 6 for lyrics. There's some vaguely satisfying rhymes in there, but again, I do think it is slightly lower than Gilbert's average. <laughs> I think a lot of why I'm not a big fan of the marriage of music and lyrics, particularly in this one, are those really long glasses. If you really were able to have that energy continue to the ends of those phrases, fill or fill the pirate glass, if you really are able to power through and make all of that note really dramatic and interesting, then you can probably get away with it, but that is a challenge for people. I have found when directing that people do get freaked out <laughs> by having to do things that are quite still, but that also have to be quite powerful. It's asking quite a lot of people, I think. I don't think the lyrics are particularly up to much. Pour, oh pour the pirate sherry, fill, oh fill the pirate glass. And to make us more than merry, let the pirate bumper pass. To me, I'm giving things sixes when I feel like I could have done better. I do really like the rhyme, For today our pirate prentice rises from indenture freed, strong his arm and keen his scent is, he's a pirate now indeed. That is nice, and that bit alone would have got a seven, but I think just the rest of it just is erring slightly on the side of clunky. Still gave it a six, I just think Gilbert is usually better than this. I did give it a seven for dramatic impact. I don't think it's unusually dramatic. I do have a bit of a thing for tenors and basses, so I do really like the sounds of really low voices. That does seem to pack quite a punch in and of itself, but in this instance, that aspect was not enough, I think, to rescue it and put it above a seven for me. Is it a successful introduction to the story? Yeah, I gave it a 7 out of 10. I think that they have definitely managed to capture exactly what is going on in that moment, but there are other ones that I feel have attached emotion to that as well, which has made it clearer and more powerful. I've also given it a 7 for its introduction to the chorus. As I have alluded to in previous videos, I do think that this opening portion of Pirates of Penzance is a bit weak. I don't think it really gets across that panache that Timothy Spall's version of Richard Temple was talking about in the film Topsy Turvy. <laughs> I don't think that this opening does justice to how good this chorus is. I've still given it a seven. I think it does a decent enough job doing it, but I think you'll see when you realise which ones I've given eights and nines and tens to, you will consider this to be a fair mark. They want a drink. They're pirates. That's it. Number 12 I have given to Fair is Rose as Bright May Day from Radagor. And this was one I was surprised how low it had come because I do consider Radagor to be one of my favourites. I think the Bridesmaids Chorus are great, but honestly, I think that apart from those first two I just discussed, I really do truly love all of these numbers and I think they are all great because remember here that we're rating openings against each other and these just in virtue of being the first thing people hear they have to be great so of course this number's still good and of course I still love it I have really fond memories of this one because playing Zora in Rudigal was my very first role at the Gilbert and Sullivan Festival I did only give it a 14 out of 20 for music and I was expecting to give it higher. I tend to think of Rudigal as being really good musically and anything from that would automatically get more like a 16, 17. But actually this piece, I don't think is terribly strong musically compared to the other bits of Rudigal. It's a little bit simplistic. It's not particularly groundbreaking. There's nothing terribly complex in the orchestration. And even though I have very fond memories of Zora's solo, I don't think that it's particularly interesting to sing. When you think that some of this music that Sullivan's written kind of gives you literal shivers in your body, like this just isn't one of those 
for me. I gave it a seven for lyrics. I do think the lyrics are nice. We've got some great rhymes in there. This is exactly what I'd expect from Gilbert. Good work, Gilbert. And I gave it a seven for dramatic impact. I don't think that a bunch of professional bridesmaids talking about whether or not Rose Maybud is going to get married is particularly dramatically interesting, but there's just something about the brightness of it that I do think deserves a seven. I gave it sevens across the board, actually. I think it introduces the story quite well. At least there's much of the story that needs to be introduced at that point, because then we get Dame Hannah explaining the situation with the ghosts. When I say that something's important to the story, I'm, I don't think it needs to get every element of the story across. Like, it doesn't matter that they've not discussed the ghosts in this first number. They discuss what needs to be discussed, and they do it well. As we can see, there, there does seem to be emotion coming into it now because these bridesmaids are actually invested in whether or not Rose gets married. And as I keep saying, that's a very successful way of telling a story. It also gets the characters of the bridesmaids across quite well. It shows their desperation. There's a lot of scope for comedy, for choreo. I think this is a great number. Absolutely no problems with it. I gave it a 42 out of 60, which I think is a very decent mark. Number 11, I have given to When Maiden Loves, She Sits and Sighs from The Yeoman of the Guard. I was a little surprised that this one came above the one before it and I may have done some fiddling, but again, I forced myself to watch all of these several times and I did watch them this time. I didn't just listen to them because I wanted to remind myself what it is that people do with these numbers. So I watched various productions on GS Opera TV, which is great, by the way. If you've not subscribed to that, you should subscribe to it. It's important to support it. But this one, I did not expect to do particularly well because it does lack a lot of the dramatic impact. Hello, kitty. Hello. Yes, kitty. Kitty, I'm doing one of my videos. It does lack the dramatic impact of some of the others. In fact, I only gave it a four for dramatic impact. It is weird that all of them, apart from this one, start with a chorus and usually a very powerful chorus. And this one is a lone singer. And to me, that might make some people think, oh, it's automatically the worst. But I thought really carefully about what makes a good opening and I actually don't think it ranks lower than this. I think it's in the right place because apart from its dramatic impact, I think it does do pretty well. I gave it a 16 out of 20 for music. I don't think the vocal line is terribly interesting. I think what really makes this one pop is the orchestration and hearing that kind of spinning motif. I love all the tempo changes and how they really fit with her emotions. So I do think it's a really clever number. I think if this had been in the mezzo aria section, it would have done pretty well. Sadly, it's here. So we're forced to judge it in this section. I gave it an eight out of 10 for the beauty slash poetry of the lyrics. I think these lyrics are absolutely gorgeous. When maiden loves, she sits and sighs, she wanders to and fro, unbidden teardrops fill her eyes, and to all questions she replies with a sad hey ho. I think the way that scans is so satisfying. I love that rhyming structure. It's also got this really beautiful emotional quality to it, which I think sets the tone of the Yeoman of the Guard very well. Do I think this is a successful introduction to the story? Yes, I gave it a seven. Just like Rudigore, it only introduces one aspect of the story, which is Phoebe's love for Fairfax, and some might say that's a relatively unimportant aspect of the story. But something else which I haven't talked about yet, but which I am slowly beginning to realise, is that narratively, Yeoman is a little bit of a nightmare. Some of the characters' arcs are the best character arcs of the canon, but altogether, as a story, I do think it struggles a bit. If you're trying to explain the plot of this opera to a person, it gets confusing very quickly in a way that, say, HMS Pinafore wouldn't. But it does introduce the story very well. I also gave it an 8 out of 10 for successfully introducing us to a character. In this case, it is Phoebe and not the chorus, but it does that extremely well. It means that one character has a whole song 
to tell us who she is and she is a very important character. It also shows us that this is going to be something a bit different. So people at the time who would have been going to see these operas for the last 15 years, this one, they go, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, this is, this is a bit different, this one, isn't it? This isn't what we're used to. And I think it would make them sit up and listen a bit better in the same way that people maybe switch genders of characters or update the setting of an opera today. It's not because they think that they know better than Gilbert or Sullivan. It's usually just to help the audience see it through fresh eyes. So maybe if you know that a certain piece has been done over and over again, if you just change the setting of it, it can just make people pay attention to the story a bit more. And I think in a way that might have been what Gilbert and Sullivan were doing by having this very different introduction, that they were telling their audience this is going to be a bit different, this one, so hold on tight because you're in for a ride. I bet that's exactly what they said. Exactly. Number 10 of my Gilbert and Sullivan openings, and again, please do not come at me and kill me for this one, because this is one that when I say it, you're going to go, what? Again, like, I did not think this would come so low either. I honestly thought this was one of the best ones. Number 10 goes to Tripping Hither, Tripping Thither from Iolanthe, which I think to be one of the most classic GNS openings ever, so why has it come so low? Well, I will tell you. First of all, I gave it a 16 out of 20 for music. That is my standard Iolanthe music mark. I think Iolanthe has wonderful music and this is no exception. It definitely deserves to get a 16. It is above Sullivan's average. It also really paints the words really well that Gilbert set. But yeah, this is where we get into difficulty. If you actually read Gilbert's text, there's not too much of it. And the opening is actually very long when you consider how little text there is. It means they're forced to repeat lots of words in various different ways, which I'm not complaining about. I think it's lovely and every time they do it, it sounds different and you can get different stuff through in the choreo. I did give it a seven for lyrics. I don't think there's anything particularly groundbreaking in the rhymes personally, but it is lovely. I also gave it a seven for dramatic impact. I think it is good. I think it is impactful, but it does suffer occasionally from there being kind of quite muted sections of it. It is possible for the music to be piano and the words written in such a way that kind of requires quite ethereal music. It is possible for that still to be dramatic, but there has to be some kind of stakes or tension there. And sadly, in the Iolanthe opening, there aren't any stakes and there's no tension whatsoever. And I do think that this means you are really relying on choreo and on comedy and on the individual director to really make this number very good. And good it can be. I gave the directorial scope of the fairies a 10 out of 10 in my chorus video. This number has enormous potential to be brilliant, but sadly the material itself, I don't think makes for an easy time directorially. <laughs> I do think that it is fine sometimes to have openings which don't really tell you much of the story. I only gave it a six for introduction to the story and if anything I think that was generous because you don't learn anything about the story in this number at all. <laughs> However, it does introduce the fairies chorus nicely. I gave it a 7 out of 10 for that. I didn't want to give it higher because again there's just no stakes yet, there's no emotion there yet. They're just like, oh we're fairies! And that's kind of it. But maybe, because it gives the director a chance to do something flashy with lights and choreo, perhaps that's enough for this opera. I'm just aware that there have been other Gilbert and Sullivan operas that have openings that might not be, you know, wham, here's some really dramatic music, but they've still managed to be really impactful, both emotionally and dramatically, and have managed to convey the character of the chorus better than this one does. And sadly, I do think this is actually a weaker number than a lot of the others, which is why it has come down so low. 
Number nine I have given to Search Throughout the Panorama from Princess Ida. Initially, I put this one down lower than it was because for some insane reason I gave it a 14 out of 20 for music because in my memory I didn't think the music of it was terribly good even though I think Princess Ida generally has incredible music but then when I actually listened to it and reminded myself of it oh my goodness it is actually great this music is is so interesting it's so orchestrally rich and it gives the singers a chance to sing in this really interesting staccato way. Search throughout the panorama. Which immediately kind of puts you in this quite militaristic mindset. And it really engages the audience and makes them listen. Which I think is very clever of Sullivan. And that key change before some misfortune evidently. Which matches in with what the lyrics are saying. It's really clever this. Sullivan did such good work in Princess Ida. I gave it a 6 out of 10 for its lyrics. I don't think it's Gilbert's absolute best. I think some of the rhymes are a little bit... You know? It takes a long time to say stuff, whereas in other areas he's been very concise. Search throughout the panorama for the daughter of King Gama. I... To make a deadly foe of Hildebrand and so, I don't know, is that fine? Maybe that's fine. I don't know. The trouble is Gilbert set such a high standard for himself elsewhere that sometimes when his lyrics are just ever so slightly not quite as good, they look a lot worse than they are. I mean, I don't know if I could write anything like this, but this is kind of getting closer to the kind of poetry that I would write, which I don't consider to be very good. I gave it a 7 for dramatic impact, and that is purely on the strength of the music. I don't think that the stakes are terribly high yet, because I don't we don't know who these people are yet. I do think they do a good job of introducing the story. I gave it an eight for that. I think that Flory and the Nakora's responses do set up the story very well. And it is the main story too, which is a plus. And do they get it across? I think they do. So yeah, eight out of 10 for that. Good job. But I only gave it a five out of 10 for introducing the character of the chorus. And I guess maybe Florian to us because we don't learn anything about the people actually singing. We get to learn stuff about Princess Ida, about Hilarion, and maybe about King Gama slightly, but when it comes to the people who are actually singing, they're just wallpaper, they're just saying these are some people and this stuff is happening to them, and we don't get to learn anything about them, which I think you do lose something from that, and again there's no problem with setting up a chorus to be more like a Greek chorus, so just being a chorus that are simply saying what's going on to the audience rather than themselves having character. But if we're thinking about what we love about Gilbert and Sullivan operas as opposed to more conventional operas, the contribution of the chorus is a huge part of that. And the chorus in Act One of Princess Ida is not a great chorus compared to the other ones. Number eight I have given to in Lazy Langer from Utopia Limited. First of all, the reason this one has come so high, despite being maybe a little bit weak in certain areas, is because of its music. I gave it an 18 out of 20, and I'm not at all sorry for that. I think that this is one of the most beautiful pieces of music that Sullivan has written, especially Filler's solo. The lyrics, I gave a 7 to. I think it is lovely, poetically and certainly nothing wrong with it in any way. I only gave it a six for its dramatic impact because it is essentially a beautiful piece where you don't really have many emotional stakes. The only emotional stakes you really have are just how beautiful the music is, so I don't think I can really count that too highly. Is it a successful introduction to the story? This is a tricky one because Utopia Limited's story does take a little bit of time to get going and then when it does get going it even then isn't really too clear what it is because there are a couple of subplots that go nowhere and yeah in general narrative isn't too strong with Utopia Limited so has it set up that quite weak narrative? 
yeah, I suppose. It's saying we live in this utopian paradise and that's all it's saying. And so I couldn't give it higher than a seven, but I don't really see what else it could have done. To be honest, could they have tried to get in some of the narrative from that dialogue into this first song? I don't think it would have worked, as I think that setting it up like this and then Kalinx coming in and suddenly shouting a lot in the utopian language, I do think that does have a quite a powerful dramatic impact. And the only way you get that dramatic impact is by having this opening number be quite muted. I also gave it a six for telling us who the chorus are, kind of what the character of the chorus is, because again, the chorus doesn't really have too much of a character in Utopia Limited, but what character they do have, it has told us well, I suppose. So I gave it a six. I think that's about the highest I can give it. But this is a good example of a number which doesn't really have any stakes at all, but still manages to have some impact purely because of how insanely good the music is. No strings in the introduction to it. Oh, so nice. And for its niceness, I could have almost wished it had come higher, but I need to be fair and give some of these other ones a chance. <laughs> Number seven, I have given to We Sail the Ocean Blue from HMS Pinafore. And this is another example of this tenor bass opening, which I think just in and of itself gives a really strong dramatic impact. I don't think this is the most successfully it's been employed, but it's certainly one of my favourites. So I gave it a seven for dramatic impact. I only gave it a six for its lyrics. I don't think the lyrics are particularly inspired in this one, certainly not as good as some of the others, but they're fine. And they serve exactly what Gilbert and Sullivan were trying to do. I only gave it a six for its introduction to the story because a little bit like in Iolanthe, you don't really learn what's going on other than, oh, they're sailors. Oh, they're on a ship. But because of that, I gave it a really high mark for the final catcher. I gave it a 9 out of 10 for telling us who the chorus are, because that's all this one does. So it did get a 9 to make up for getting low in the story category. Even Buttercup's song doesn't really tell us what the story is. It takes a long time to learn what the heart of HMS Pinafore really is. But, we, but when we get there, it is a very strong story. But yeah, this opening is impactful, it's dramatic, it's really fun. I gave it a 16 out of 20 for music. I think the music in it is really strong. I love tenor bass harmonies, especially when it's split into more than just two parts. Ugh. I mean, I'm, I've already gone on about the autumn of our lives, but this is also incredible. I love this number, massive fan of this one, but there's not really too much more to say about it because I don't think it's particularly interesting. And I think because of that, other numbers have come higher, but I do think of it very highly and it is one of my favorite openings. Number six, I have given to Hark the Hour of Tennis Sounding from Trial by Jury. I gave it a 15 out of 20 for music. I don't think it's quite as strong as we sailed the ocean blue, but it's certainly pretty strong and it's definitely impactful musically. I love the... Yeah, that is great and it's properly like we are opening the show and we are in your face and for that I gave it an 8 out of 10 for dramatic impact I think it really just shoves down your throat exactly where you are and what is going on I gave it a 7 for lyrics I think they are Gilbert good but I don't think they're any more than that I think that is about the right mark to give them we have a 9 out of 10 for successful introduction to the story this is certainly the most successful we've had so far, just in terms of setting the scene and saying, we are in a courtroom, we are about to try a case that involves Edwin and Angelina. And that is done in a way that is both musically and lyrically very skilled. And for that, I think this is the first one that I'm like, yeah, this one really takes every box. There are no weak parts of this at all. Apart from maybe the contribution of the chorus. While the chorus are very powerful in this number, it doesn't really tell you very much about who they are. And I don't think this is a problem. It's just that when the chorus 
do have character, I just think it's better. It misses that vital ingredient of the chorus being really involved in the story. And so uh, for that, I've only given it a six. However, even if the character of the chorus themselves even if they're not really involved in the story of trial by jury they are certainly emotionally invested in what's going on so i do think this is still a really strong number whenever i'm at the festival and we do the yearly potluck of trial by jury it's just such a laugh it's such a laugh doing this one number five i have given to won't it be a pretty wedding from the grand duke this is one that even though I marked it where it is, as I'm making this video, it was only one mark away from the trial by jury one. I'm wondering if maybe Hark the Hour should have gone above this one. Tell me what you think. Because even though I do think it ticks all the boxes in a way that trial by jury maybe didn't quite do so, I don't know if I'm as fond of it at this very moment. I gave it a 17 out of 20 for its music. I don't think it's quite as good as the music in Utopia Limited, if we think about it orchestrally and vocally. I think it's about on a level with the Princess Ida one search throughout the panorama. I gave it a 7 out of 10 for its lyrics. Again, they're just the standard Gilbert version of good. There's some lovely rhymes in there. And I love the way that Sullivan has arranged the lyrics as well, which I've put in the music category. The, won't it be a pretty wedding? Won't it be a pretty wedding? Will not Lisa look? Not will not Lisa look delightful? <laughs> You know what I mean? It's these, these like countering lyrics. I think it's really powerful having the tenor spaces and altos just do that constant stream of singing with the sopranos over the top. I think it has a really lovely effect. I give it an 8 out of 10 for dramatic impact. Again, I think that is more the music than what's actually being said. I don't think the stakes are terribly high here. We're just talking about a wedding, but it certainly does pack a punch. Maybe not quite as much as one I haven't talked about yet, which is also about a wedding. I gave it a 7 out of 10 for how well it introduces the story. Again, it doesn't introduce every aspect of the story. How can it? It's the Grand Duke. There are so many things going on, it would be very hard to do that. What it does do is that it really introduces the character of the chorus very well. I also gave that an 8 out of 10, especially in that middle section with the four people giving their opinions about Lisa and her wedding dress. I think that perfectly encapsulates that really fun, feisty, kind of a bit catty chorus attitude that the Grand Duke has. So in that sense, it's one of the most successful when it comes to setting up who the chorus are and exactly what role they're going to be playing. Yes, they are observers, just like any other chorus, but my goodness, they have opinions about things. And this is set up so well in that opening number. And it's musically wonderful. Yeah, this is better than Trial by Jury. So what happens when I'm making these videos is that I get so into talking about one of them that when I move on to the next number in the list, I'm like, oh, well, surely this can't be as good as the one I've just been talking about. And then I start talking about it. I'm like, oh, no, no, I was right. Usually I'm right. Number four, I have given to If You Want To Know Who We Are from The Mikado. And this, I think, is the pinnacle of tenors and basses singing in this, in these delicious harmonies in such an impactful way. Even though what they're talking about isn't anything particularly emotional or dramatic. It has a dramatic impact purely because it's just so in your face musically. I gave it a 17 for music and I gave it a 9 out of 10 for dramatic impact. Because I think even when you're just in an amateur production of this and maybe you don't even have the best singers in the world, it still has such an impact just because of the way it's written. It's so skillfully done. If we completely forget that these lyrics can be potentially offensive and only focus on the poetry, they're really, really good. <laughs> so I did give it an eight for its lyrics. What you have here is such exquisite poetry, and I don't want to read out what those lyrics are, but have a read of them just as poetry, not even thinking about the music. And they're so well written. The scansion is so satisfying in a way that is better than Gilbert's average, I think. I think it introduces relatively successfully who the gentlemen of Japan are, like that chorus. I gave it a seven for that because 
they are singing wallpaper but they are very useful wallpaper in that they're kind of an expositional device so they help the principals introduce themselves and basically what they're doing is they create such an initial impression that it makes you listen to them in more detail in the future so i do think in that respect they have introduced themselves as people that we should listen to because they are very clear and make a very powerful statement however this song much like tripping hither tripping thither doesn't tell you anything about what's gonna happen and this is i think part of why this could be seen as a little bit problematic because when you think about Iolanthe, that opening song is saying we are fairies and then this opening song is saying we are japanese <laughs> and to me it's just it's not really the same thing but the way it's set up is that it is kind of the same thing there's something that just doesn't sit very well with me about that this is one of the songs in the mikado that even though I absolutely love it for what it was intended to be, I do appreciate how this number really wouldn't sit well with a lot of people today. So I'm going to read out just a tiny little bit of it, just to express my surprise about something. You don't understand these things. It is simply court etiquette. I was today years old when I realised those were the words. I thought the words were, it is simply called etiquette. How many times have I seen the Mikado? <laughs> I've been in it twice. I've directed it once. I thought it was called. Isn't that funny? I'm still today finding things that I've misheard and not realised. Number three is 20 Lovesick Maidens We from Patience. Now this is a great example of one where the music isn't very dramatic and makes you sit up and whams you in the face with how good it is, yet it still manages to be impactful, incredibly emotional and also very funny. I do think this is probably the funniest opening of all of them. I gave it a 17 out of 20 for music, which is way higher than I thought I'd give it. I think I originally gave it a 15, but then when I listened to it, I realised it's a lot more than just that 20 lovesick maidens we. There's so much going on in the orchestra and these little middle sections. Love here, son, hop. They say those are, those little kind of are, like, are they scales or arpeggios in the woodwind? That's incredible. And the richness that goes on underneath what Ella's singing. And just the vocal lines in general. Ella's solo, is just gorgeous there. Also Angela's solo is so heartfelt. Yeah, just the one that goes over those woodwinds. Love is on hope, they say, or oh, love will die. Those like those accident not accidentals, what are they called? That I wanna say it's chromatic, but that's colours. What's the word? It is chromatic. I, my brain just broke there for a moment. I was thinking, can't be that can't be the right word because that's about colours, isn't it? Anyway, I love the chromaticness of Angela's solo. <laughs> I give it an eight out of ten for lyrics because boy, these lyrics are good. Oh my goodness me, Ella's so get this. Patience is full of insanely good poetry. I guess it has to be because it's about poetry. Go breaking heart. Go dream of love requited, go foolish heart, go dream of lovers plighted, go madcap heart, go dream of never waking, and in thy dream forget that thou art breaking. Oh! As a person who has great medical difficulty regulating her emotions, it's amazing how somebody who a lot of people see today as being very stuffy and Victorian was able to express himself in this beautiful way. And yes, he did the vehicle of Ella to do that, but all of that was in Gilbert's head. So he must in some way have empathised with what these people were feeling. And isn't that interesting? Because we don't think of Gilbert himself as being a person who was that emotional, but clearly he had such stuff going on inside his head. I know that he was to an extent doing pastiches of other operas that had come before but still to get this emotional richness of language you feel he must have had an inner life which 
maybe we're only starting to appreciate now that as a society we are encouraging other to be a bit more emotionally free maybe suddenly we're realizing oh gosh gilbert he had this enormous well of emotion inside himself that he wasn't really able to himself express but he was able to through his comic operas and they are meant to be funny but maybe that was a disguise for how much he was feeling because for him and for people like me who maybe do have a bit of difficulty expressing themselves sometimes we express our deepest and darkest parts through comedy and that is the perfect encapsulation of this this number here just being able to be both hilarious and ridiculously dramatic i love this number did i mention that i like this number i gave it a 10 out of 10 for introducing the character of the chorus to us in regard to telling us who the chorus are and setting the tone of the rapturous maidens for the rest of the opera it could not have been better than this I and mean, it is just perfect I gave it an eight for its introduction to the story. It does do a good job of telling us the emotional story behind the Maiden's actions, but I don't know how much actual plot it delivers. Still, I gave it an eight, which is better than average, but I do want to acknowledge that perhaps there's not as much exposition as you get in Hark the Hour of Tennis sounding, where you actually learn facts and names. <laughs> And yeah, I only gave it a seven for its dramatic impact because it doesn't hit you in the face in the same way that the gentlemen of Japan do. But I do want to acknowledge that despite its slower tempo and its more laid back feeling, it still does manage to be dramatically impactful. Number two, I have given to Ring Forth You Bells from The Sorcerer, which again, I keep thinking that the sorcerer, you know, maybe this isn't quite as good as the others, but thus far, it's doing pretty well. I loved the dialogue when I did the dialogue video. Alexis's second act aria came number two in the tenor arias. I actually think that I may have marked a lean too low. And this opening is an absolute banger. I adore this opening number. And even though I knew it would do well, I hadn't realised quite how good it was. I watched several different versions of it and honestly there wasn't a single one that I thought, uh, this isn't very good. Everyone does a great job with this number because it's just got such good material. You can't really go too wrong with this one because of how good it is musically. I mean, especially, and I want to draw attention to that section that goes, ring forth the bells with clarins sound for the job. That bit. The rousing quality in the orchestra of that. I only gave it a seven for lyrics. I think it is, again, Gilbert's good. I don't think it's better than his average, but it is lovely. I do like that poetry. Forget your notes of mournful lay and from your throats pour joy today. And it does a very good job of setting up the story. I think a slightly cleaner and better job than the one in Grand Duke does. It doesn't just tell you about Lisa, it tells you about Aline and Alexis and it does so in such a clean way over and over again that by the end of that song you're in no doubt about who was getting married. <laughs> the little bit about the feast on the green is maybe not so clear but it's still you still know who's getting married and that's the important thing. And you know what kind of people the chorus are too. Not that the chorus in a sorcerer is too well defined as it is, but the fact that they say, oh, be sure, that affectation of speech, I think, is specific to the kind of person that Gilbert was trying to portray. Just an ordinary villager on the southern coast. <laughs> it sets up that they're a really characterful bunch of people who want to have a good time and the music does that really well. It's just all in all an absolutely fantastic expositional number that not only is hugely fun to both be in and to listen to, it's also lyrically nice and it's dramatically impactful. I gave it an 8 out of 10 for its dramatic impact. I don't think it quite has the same impact as The Gentleman of Japan but it's certainly way up there. I think it's an incredibly good number but it didn't quite make it to number one for me and actually number one made it by a whole three points so I couldn't even have fiddled to make Ring Forthy Bells number one 
And speaking of number one, that is List and Learn from the Gondoliers. And I didn't go into good morning, pretty mate. I've just, I cut short at the end of, cut short. <laughs> I cut, I cut short at the end of List and Learn. I gave it a 19 out of 20 for music. And I think that is really well deserved. This opening to Gondoliers is one of the richest and most interesting openings there are in the canon. The opening of Gondoliers in general is, I think, the highlight of it. I think the very opening of the opening is one of the highlights of that. Merriest Fellows is another. We're called Gondolieri is another. But List and Learn, I think, is truly beautiful. I think the way the harmonies work, but then when they go into unison, when they want to say something really important, how well the vocal line works with the orchestra, how sophisticated the orchestration is. I gave it an eight for the lyrics. The things that I like that Gilbert does lyrically, what kind of makes my heart go, ooh, is when he makes you wait for the resolution of his rhymes. I don't know quite what the word is for that. It's like delayed gratification, isn't it? By a law of maiden's making, accents of a heart that's aching, even though that heart be breaking, should by maiden be unsaid. Though they love with love exceeding, they must seem to be unheeding. Go ye then and do their pleading, roses white and roses red. There's something to me that is so perfect about that. And I don't know how subjective that opinion is. It could just be that... There's a certain scansion that I happen just to love the sound of, and that is it. <laughs> two there are for whom in duty every maiden Venice sighs, two so peerless in their beauty that they shame the summer skies. It's just, this is just great. Oh. And it sets up the characters so well, and the story. I gave it a nine for both of those. I think it does an excellent job of both. Yes, again, it's not the main plot of the gondoliers, but gondoliers is one that has quite a bit going on and they do what they can. They can't set up too much in this first instance, but the way they do it is through this extreme emotion, much like the rapturous maidens do. And I think it does have the potential to be as funny as the maidens, yet it has this much more powerful dramatic impact. I gave it an eight for its dramatic impact. The only thing, the only thing about this number that gets me, picture this, me as 18 years old, I just received my box set of Brent Walker DVDs, which was sadly missing Grand Duke and Utopia Limited, but it was in looking for a Grand Duke DVD that I stumbled across the fact that the festival existed. So I'm there, I get these DVDs, I watch the gondoliers, and I know nothing about this show. I've not researched the story. I'm just watching it straight without any preconceptions. When they say the lyrics, we alas are four and 20, they alas are only two. I thought they were talking about their ages. So I thought Fiametta was saying, we're all 24 years old and the people we like are two years old. And I continued to think that until Marco and Giuseppe entered. And even then I was a bit confused. So I thought there was some really weird thing going on. But it is quite possible that I am the only person that was confused. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching my GNS openings video. And please do hit that subscribe button and the like button. It really does help me. It makes me feel like people are enjoying these. Please let me know what you think in the comments. I'd love to hear all your opinions because honestly, I'm really easily won round and my opinions are very easily changed. So give it a go.